Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Karina Meneses, and uh, as Liz mentioned, today I will be presenting on modeling autonomous behavior uh, for microscopic simulation studies in urban areas. Um, I will mention this is a project um, coming from the Ford Ohio State University Alliance Framework, uh, which is taking place uh, from 2019 to 2021. Uh, so it's currently in progress. Uh, so I will be, I will be presenting um, on some of the uh, uh, results and research. Um, so first, let me introduce uh, myself. Um, I um, I have a background in mathematics and computer science. Um, I received my bachelor's from, from the University of California, San Diego, in 2018. Um, and I am currently an electrical and computer engineering PhD student at the Ohio State University. Um, I specialize on the AV decision-making behavior, um, particularly uh, then I deal a lot with simulations of autonomous vehicles, um, machine learning, uh, supply to autonomous vehicles, which really means uh, behavior cloning, uh, deep neural networks, et cetera, um, as well as control theory, again, going back to AV decision-making behavior. Um, so this is um, our lab. Uh, we have, uh, this is, a couple of our vehicles that we use to test uh, autonomous driving uh, on. Um, and we are a small to medium sized lab group um, uh, with two, two professors um, and about 15 graduate students um, with uh, a couple of uh, VC scholars. Um, and you can see me on the far right. Um, so just in case that is me. Um, so let me go a little bit about uh, the goals of uh, this kind of uh, this, this tool research. Um, really what we want to do is to address the effects of uh, the race for autonomous vehicles and what it means to the public. So we want to see uh, what, how does different rates of penetration rates, um, introduction of penetration rates, uh, of autonomous vehicles, autonomous shuttles into the traffic affects uh, surrounding traffic, affects safety, um, et cetera. Um, we also want to see how uh, different types of autonomous ride sharing, um, so shuttles, ride hailing, ride sharing, how does that uh, make a positive impact um, or any impact into the, the traffic um, environment? Um, and as a little bit of a, um, of, of a background, um, I will mention that there are some studies that uh, have um, foreseen that with uh, more AVs introduced into the market, um, although less people will own these AVs, more, more AVs will be on the road um, at the same time. So what we are really, really looking at is being able to optimize um, our uh, Deployable, deployable uh, algorithms so that we can have um, less trips and more passenger comfort. Um, so, again, more of more of a background. Um, so, to stimulate what we want to, what we would talk about later, um, I first want to talk about the Smart Columbus project. Um, so, Columbus, we are located in. Columbus, Ohio, um, and Columbus got a grant from the federal government um, in order to uh, better some communities. Really, we wanted uh, to close gaps in transportation, affordable housing, healthy food, childcare, recreation, and education. Um, and so some of this money really uh, got devoted into employing um, a autonomous shuttle service inside of a community, um, a couple communities. Particularly, we, we will be talking about the Linden residential area. Um, and so this, this shuttle got uh, deployed inside this community. Um, but as a case study, um, I just want to emphasize, emphasize a little bit of what happened once this, uh, this all uh, got deployed. So a little bit of a background on the actual shuttle. Um, it was uh it had some limitations so obviously it wasn't it wasn't a level five um a v um however uh some of the most outstanding limitations are that one it had a fixed route um and two 
um, it was uh, 50 miles per hour max speed. Um, not in the actual engine, but it was just electronically uh, stopped at 50 miles per hour. Um, and so you can, you, you see this and you, you think, well, yeah, that is for safety. That is because um, this is kind of a, uh, a trial run. Um, however, it created a lot of issues uh, with surrounding traffic because you uh, can imagine a vehicle going at 50 miles per hour in a 25, 35 miles per hour sun, zone um, and having cars behind it um, basically being delayed from uh, passing by. Uh, you would have cars behind it trying to go uh, forward and trying to overtake. However, uh, the shuttle did not behave as an actual driver. So there was issues there. Um, I actually went and I rode inside of the uh, shuttle. Um, and one of the issues that it had, um, for example, was that uh, in order to make a left unprotected turn, it would stop at the traffic light um, and it would take a long time because then it would switch over to operator mode. Um, and then once the operator uh, gave it the okay to go ahead and turn, um, the vehicle still uh, performed some checks. So there was a delay. Um, and so there was, there was a lot of uh, limitations here. And other issues which are really more software related um, became, uh, came about with, uh, for example, elevation profiles. So once, uh, one, before this was deployed, um, they did some trial errors. Um, and in trying to get into a parking lot, um, there was an elevation and the vehicle thought that the elevation was a wall. So instead of going and overtaking the entrance um, inside of the parking lot, uh, it would just stop. Um, and so this was more of a, of a software bug, of course, but something that probably could have been detected beforehand. Another, which really killed the whole uh, taxi shuttle uh, experiment, was sudden stop. So particularly, um, and this was actually on the news, uh, the, the shuttle uh, suddenly stopped um, at one point and it knocked one of the passengers off of the seat. Um, and so because of this, uh, many people were mad and this shuttle got discontinued uh, until further notice. And as far as I know, this is only one of a dozen in the whole of the U.S. Uh, shuttles that were discontinued uh, based on these kind of um, issues. So really the question is, how can we foresee these issues before we deploy? Um, and so really um, the, the answer is simulation. Uh, we need to be able to simulate so that we can see this issue, so that we can um, First, even issues that we don't see right now. Uh, perhaps you can say that the issues that we saw before um, are, are issues that you could see just by thinking about it a little bit longer, maybe. But uh, in general, we there's some issues that we just can't foresee uh, from, uh, like it, it will it would escape our minds. Um, so the way that we have uh, created a system for simulation we've decided to concentrate on two features of um, whole of autonomous driving, safety and mobility. Uh, so when it comes to safety, we want to look at sensors, um, at data processing, uh, data manipulation, um, sensor malfunction, uh, weather conditions, how these weather conditions uh, uh, alter our sensors um, and therefore alter our uh, algorithms. Um, and we also want to look at vehicle dynamics. So in really in here, we want to also take a look at AV decision making. Um, and again, coupling it with sensors. Um, but not only that, so here really you can say uh, we could have uh, foreseen the sudden stop and how we could have uh, made that a little bit more smooth for the passengers. Um, however, when it comes for uh, in terms of the, the, the speed limit, um, we need, really need to look at mobility. So we need to look at traffic, 
uh, we, need, we need to look at traffic flow prediction, uh, network traffic demand. Um, we need to look at surrounding and, and trends inside of the places that we want to deploy the AV shuttle. Um, and we also, besides looking at the shuttle as an Eagle vehicle, uh, we also need to look at it as a component inside of a larger network, which means we need to look at the sh uh, behavior of the shuttle uh, as a general driving behavior, um, as well as uh, the ride hailing application behavior and connected autonomous vehicle behavior. Um, so all of these um, are our focus of, uh, of our simulation uh, environment deployment. Um, so let me talk a little bit more about um, what three components, main components uh, we look at when building a simulation mock-up. Um, so we need to have an environment model um, which I will mention, um, I will talk this a little bit more about this later, but uh, we need to have a very detailed model of the environment. Um, when it comes to AV testing, because we are testing sensors, uh, we need to have uh, more than uh, basically the kinds of maps that you would use in DSIM. Uh, so from the maps that we use inside of the environment model, we can then uh, we can then uh, infer maps for these in the environment. So uh, some of the tools that we've used um, are OpenStreetMap, uh, Sumo, Overpass, and OpenDrive. Um, and this is uh, so that we can place, uh, well, we can define the roads, of course, but also place stop signs, uh, place traffic lights, um, as well as manipulate intersections, houses, vegetation, and this is where a lot of detail and handwork goes into. Um, but then we also need to have um, an AV model. So this really means um, dynamics, um, information from sensors, uh, decision-making algorithms, uh, fidelity of sensors. So everything that goes into the actual AV shuttle, um, AV or AV behavior. Um, and then in order to extrapolate, uh, when you have a traffic model. So uh, we've used vSIM for general traffic information. Um, we've used uh, vSIM to further fine tune our traffic light timings, uh, meaning using, uh, for example, um, uh, ring uh, barrier uh, traffic light timings um, and uh, having it be more realistic, really. Um, and then extrapolating to uh, find more surrounding traffic behavior that can be incorporated inside of the sensors that the AV model sees. Um, and then of course, playing around with different traffic volumes, um, et cetera. So this is uh, a map of the data flow uh, inside of a simulation environment. Um, and really you will see that we have three modules. We have uh, the module that processes sensor, the module that, that simulates the vehicle dynamics, and the module that simulates the traffic uh, conditions. So all of these combined um, allows us to simulate uh, and see very fine details inside of uh, autonomous shuttles. So let me start with, uh, all of the information that is created really inside of the vehicle dynamics uh, software. Um, for this, we're using CarMaker, um, but basically all of the information is uh, is simulated inside of uh, our vehicle dynamics software. And then uh, it is uh, sent into vSIM to initialize uh, all of uh, the uh, like the position of the of the vehicle, um, and then vSIM will create a traffic surrounding environment. We'll send it back into CarMaker, um, which will then uh, we will sense data. Sense and that data is sent over into a vehicle in vehicle PC, which will then do some rendering uh, to determine uh, more closely what the behavior of the AV shuttle should be. Um, and then this will be sent back into the uh, the vehicle dynamic simulation. So 
we we did go over with uh, the drive PX2. And this was because uh, we wanted to use NVIDIA's uh, DriveWorks framework. Um, however, uh, the reason why we went for a in-vehicle PC and we extrapolated to, to an in-vehicle PC is because we wanted to have something where we could have um, kind of a, a plug and play. So what we did is that we built, um, we built drivers uh, for CarMaker such that all of the information inside of CarMaker uh, would basically spoof um, sensors. Uh, so the in-vehicle PC uh, senses um, all of the information as if it were uh, a, a real sensor. So as if it were a real camera or as if it were a real lighter. And the reason for this is because once you are done testing inside of the whole uh, simulated environment, you can then take the in-vehicle PC and then put it inside the vehicle and then test more um, inside of a uh, real environment. Um, so not only that, actually, but uh, even if you remove the in-vehicle PC component, you can still use uh, these drivers and et cetera inside um, some other software like Simulink. So you can uh, run all of the information and do all of the data inside of the same computer. Now, uh, one thing I will mention is that we did couple these processes in different computers. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, we wanted to have speed. And so each, basically each computer is dedicated to a particular process. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the map um, and the environment building. Um, so as I kind of hinted at before, um, building this map isn't just a drag and drop type of thing. Um, there's actually, I'm pretty sure people are, are, are familiar with this. There's companies that build, uh, build this map. So our approach to building these maps um, as, as openly as possible is to grab them uh, from OpenStreetMap um, and then filter them using Overpass API um, and then edit them using Jotham. Um, so this is more so Overpass API is really used for like actual syntax, whereas Jotham is used for uh, uh, intersections and, and geometry, et cetera. Um, and then from here, we are able to use um, a, a Suma tool that will allow us to import uh, into our vehicle dynamics um, overall uh, environment. Um, and so then we just uh, go into our vehicle dynamics editor and then we add in even more um, features. So. Again, as I said, uh, these maps have to be very high detailed. Um, it, there's a difference between the map from uh, a vehicle dynamics perspective to a traffic uh, simulation perspective. The main difference being that a traffic simulation perspective, we are looking at a two-dimensional map. So we are looking at links and nodes. It's basically a directed graph. Um, when we are looking at um, the perspective on a uh, uh, vehicle dynamics, we are now looking at three-dimensional data because we need to take into account uh, elevations, for example. Um, but we also need to take into account uh, surface materials. So what happens if the road is wet? Um, what happens if uh, the environment, for example? Um, so in houses, trees, et cetera. So we need to take this into account. So uh, once we build this map for the overall environment, uh, we need to then import it into uh, our traffic environment. And that's actually pretty easy. Um, having, uh, you're basically taking a step down in resolution. Um, so you can then um, build up maps um, inside of uh, vSIM from the vehicle dynamics simulation environment. Um, I will mention again in highlighting that this is a, a, a test case 
um, or an example case um, from the previously mentioned uh, uh, Linden area show. So this is actually an area in Columbus uh, that we've been um, uh, building. Uh, and uh, the picture or the video on the left is uh, Linden. Um, and the patient on the right is uh, another area that actually had a shuttle um, uh, called the, the Ecosi route. Um, video that looks more in depth on the uh, the actual vehicle dynamics uh, simulation. Um, and again, you will see the difference. Um, this is a lot more detailed than than this. And really the detail comes in elevation profile. Um, and, and vegetation, of course. Now, somebody may ask, well, uh, if you really want to use this, um, uh, first of all, you will see that uh, our environment isn't, uh, the graphics are not as intensive as something like uh, Carla. Um, so anything built on top of Unreal, uh, so Carla or AirSim, um, you know, the, the environments that, uh, that are very popular to test uh, deep learning in. Um, and so the question would be, why would we want to use this instead of that? Um, and so the answer is, well, uh, these other environments, Carla, Airsim, um, they do not have a very realistic vehicle dynamics. So they don't have, uh, they don't have powertrain models. That will that are actually accurate to the actual vehicle that we want. Uh, so, and this is important when we're looking at CO2 emissions, um, et cetera. Um, now, we have uh, we have actually trained um, in your network using uh, this kind of uh, data. Um, it is not fine tuned as of yet, but uh, it is possible. Um, so, more about the vehicle dynamics. Um, we basically wanted to focus on two two parts. Um, what would be private vehicles, so single occupancy. Um, what would happen if you were to own an AV uh, versus, again, taxi shuttles, um, AV shuttles, um, when we have private vehicles, so uh, up to eight passengers. So we wanted to stay realistic to the vehicle dynamics. This is more information as to how the actual simulation uh, timings work. Um, I mean, I went a little bit in depth uh, earlier, but again, we start with um, our simulation information uh, kickstart, both uh, our vehicle dynamics and vSIM. Um, and then vehicle dynamics pause for a little bit so that vSIM can update and generate traffic, uh, which is then sent into uh, the simulation of car maker uh, or vehicle dynamics. Uh, and then uh, both of these are paused uh, and the information is sent into uh, the data acquisition and decision making, which this module can be uh, either, either any in-vehicle PC or it can be um, any back-end process. Um, so and then from here, we derive an update, uh, an updated maneuver, which is then passed into the vehicle dynamics. Um, and then the whole simulation starts all over again. So, as I mentioned before, um, there's two kinds of perspectives that we can see. We can, we can think about, uh, the perspective of an autonomous shuttle in, in the context of an eagle vehicle, and we can uh, think about the context of an autonomous shuttle as a member of the surrounding traffic. Um, so basically, I will now show um, a little bit more on what it is, um, what how we address the surrounding traffic. Um, uh, but before that, um, just a little bit more clips um, in terms of um, as an ego vehicle. So. These are just clips uh, that show you, uh, these are actually from the NVIDIA stack um, of DryWorks. So we take 
uh, the information in our surrounding um, environment and process it, there's a dry flex too. And this is what we see. Now, well, I will mention, and I'm sure somebody's wondering um, about uh, the fuzziness. Uh, this is actually done because uh, because NVIDIA's DriveWorks are trained on real data, and so an easy way to trick it into thinking um, and getting more accuracy is to just uh, add some uh, noise instead of the image, uh, because the image is basically too defined, too clear. Uh, there's too many hard edges, etc. Um, now this is another demonstration, and this is uh, this is again Linden area, but this is a cool simulation of our vehicle dynamics uh, software with uh, vSIM. Uh, so these these all of the characteristics that I've that I've um, mentioned before are imported. So you can you're driving, and as you're driving, you're also you can also be collecting information. Um, from the uh, sensors, and also uh, the sensors uh, collect information that is really generated at the level of vSIM. Um, so this is all this is all uh, happening at the same time. Now, now I can talk a little bit more about um, a shuttle as a member of the uh of the actual surrounding traffic. And so the question here was how to simulate the shuttles um at that level. Uh because you can uh you can simulate in general um an A V vehicle uh but how can you add on the, the tag of shuttle? So uh for this uh first of all um we parametrize the vehicle as an autonomous, autonomous vehicle. And the way that you do that is you use a Widman driver, uh, the Widman driver parameterization. So you can go inside of vSIM and then um, have it so that the uh, uh, the vehicle will uh, run as, the, uh, as an autonomous vehicle. Now the question is, well, if you deploy that vehicle, now that vehicle is an AV inside of mixed traffic. But the question is, how can we go a step further and say that it is a shuttle? And so what we did was build a, uh, basically a package that allows us to uh, simulate that. Um, and this package uh, consists of three modules, three main modules, um, the taxi broker, uh, the request, uh, and the path assignment. Um, so all of these processes work in parallel at simulation time so that uh, we can get, uh, we can basically simulate a, uh, a traffic broker. Um, and so the, the taxi broker in general uh, is a, is basically the overseeing overall entity that manages requests and path assignments. It's the top for the top general basically. Um, so it manages a uh, global simulation of the autonomous shuttle behavior. Um, it decides the number and type of taxis at simulation runtime. Um, and then it keeps information on location and status uh, of both departure and, ar and arrival of the taxis. Um, and then it delegates jobs. So it talks to requests to say, hey, uh, take the shuttle and uh, send it over. Um, and the request really manages um, uh, simulate. It, it's a simulation of passenger demand. So we're simulating um, all the people that are asking for uh, to be picked up and dropped off. So there's uh, there's pedestrians that we've uh, we simulate at particular hotspots, um, and so these pedestrians will ask for taxis um, and. And request would basically send it over to taxi broker so that we can get uh, we can get a kind of talking between the two. Um, it also keeps information on numbers of requests and specific of requests. Um, and so uh, 
And so these two basically talk to each other, taxi broker, and request their uh, one pull from pushes. And then path assignment is really aiding both of them. Uh, path assignment keeps information about the network and available paths. Um, and then it basically it delegates, since taxi broker delegates jobs, uh, path assignment's uh, work is to create the path that will get that job done. Um, and so this, this is basically, uh, this is the Python library. Um, and so I will say, and I mean, I'm kind of a programming nerd, but uh, in general, uh, we actually try this as a long script. Um, and I will say that tinies were not, uh, were not the best. So the best way to implement this um, is using an object approach. Well, so far, obviously, I'm sure there's many more um, ways of optimizing this, but so far the way that this is working is first of all with an object approach and second of all using optimized libraries, meaning obviously using NumPy instead of, um, for example, uh, many uh, of the libraries inside of, uh, like the native libraries inside of Python. Um, and this actually allows us to run this at a pretty good speed. So pretty much, um, uh, if you do not use this approach with objects and 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 uh, NumPy and optimized libraries, um, you will basically have to sit there and uh, watch the taxi being dropped off, um, and it will take a long time. It will take you can't speed up, basically. Um, whereas if you do it this way, you can speed up um, at least depending on your computer hardware, but you can also, you can actually uh, make time uh, pass by fast. Now, uh, in general, uh, pram the, this, this workflow um, of uh, the taxi summary of the taxi classes, um, and also the workflow of something that, um, that I will talk about in the next slide, um, which is basically param parameter tuning, um, really all work through the common interface. So the Python script is really what drives um, the behavior of the PTV uh, vSIM network. Um, and then once the Python scripts run that behavior, uh, we get the information and then we either send it to, again, Python in, in, in the case of parameter tuning because then we need to get all those parameters and uh, make it so that we can uh, obtain concise numbers, um, in that case, run it again, um, or we send it to a co-simulation engine, which is what I uh, talked about earlier, um, so that all of the information can be sent out. Uh, and again, these, these, uh, this really all go through a Python pi pipeline for us. Um, um, however, uh, the common interface uses different, can be used in different languages. So Python, uh, C, C++, et cetera. Now, this is some uh, some runs of the behavior of uh, write sharing. So this is, this was basically our, uh, one of our first tests, which is basically just, uh, and by the way, this is uh, one of, the other networks that were used inside of the uh, the AV shuttle deployment testing. So this is a pretty simple uh, routine, which basically just calls uh, the shuttle, and uh, the shuttle goes to the place where it, where it's being called, and then drops a passenger, picks a passenger, etc. It's it's um. It's it's kind of the, our baby steps. Um, another another demonstration of how this um, works. So again, and you will see uh, the blue boxes are actually uh, places where the AV shuttle is being called from. So these these blue boxes are actually can be determined at runtime. So if you're running the network, um, suddenly you can just program in and say uh, 
please send this broker to that place and then it will do so. Um, and then this is a little bit more on uh, demonstrations on uh, connected autonomous vehicles. Um, so this is uh, in Sayo Mile, which is again another uh, another route that we use for testing. Now, um, with the CAV capabilities and, and overall traffic behavior, um, sorry, taxi behavior. Um, I will mention that our library basically has uh, allowed us to uh, be flexible. So one of the things that we wanted to look into uh, is what would happen with different kinds of uh, AV idling behavior. Um, in this case, uh, we basically went and said, okay, um, what happens? Can we, we've coded different ways of uh, idling. So returning to base, um, idle, or uh, callbacks, for de uh, depending on, on request. So this is all really possible due to the fact that we took the approach of having different modules. Um, and so this is basically just a flow chart of how that would work. Um, we first generate tasks. We uh, give priority to uh, older requests and we compute distance. Um, we assign them the, the task to closest uh, taxi, which basically um, allows us to uh, uh, have more of a realistic way of idling um, and a, and a very more realistic way of assigning tasks to different taxis. Um, now, these were some of the uh, some of the study parameters that we wanted to look into. So we want to look into penetration rate, so deployment of fleet size, request demand. Um, we want to look into mixture of types of requests, residential vested hotspots, and CAV capabilities. Now, one of the issues that we ran into was that uh, the, the, the network that we used uh, was, first of all, um, it was small, as you can see from the previous maps, um, maps, uh, map outlines. But this is because the AV shuttles really just worked inside of a smaller network. Um, and so the question here was, how can we uh, fine tune the network to, uh, to the network's traffic? using the readily available data, which is honestly not uh, very much data um, in our case. Um, and so uh, in order to do this, we went back and we again used uh, this whole uh, architecture of using um, the COM interface in order to uh, have a subroutine that optimizes traffic weight on the whole network. So what we came up with um, first of all, we used uh, data from um, MORPC, um, which is a Mid-Ohio uh, Regional Planning Commission. Uh, some of this data, this data isn't, this data set isn't very large. I can't recall from the, from the top of my head how many years, um, but definitely not more than 10. Um, and it's a small, it's a small region, so we can't really, um, we can't really infer uh, we can't really expect there to be a lot of data inside of that region. So after some research and looking at uh, Federal Highway Administration's uh, guidelines, um, we ended up use, using um, uh, some, some, fine, some heuristics to fine tune the network. And really what we used um, was uh, the so-called uh, taboo optimizing algorithm. Um, so what we wanted to do was to optimize uh, how many vehicles uh, will the vehicle flow inside of the network. So we set up uh, some feelers inside of the network. And so what we do is basically optimize this network based on the taboo uh, search algorithm. So we initialize um, our set of vehicles, which is basically uh, how how many um, at 
the input places, um, how fast they're going in general, um, and then some of the parameters in terms of the overall um, vehicles. So the weed man's parameters, basically. Um, and then we basically are running the taboo search algorithm, which is finding a way to uh, minimize uh, the list. But it's a heuristic way. So uh, if you, the reason why this problem is hard is because there's no way to formulate it instead of a closed form. So this is why we have to use a taboo, uh, a taboo heuristic. I mean, you could use any other heuristic, um, but there is some research that says that um, taboo is one of the best ways of uh, optimizing this so that we don't lose time um, searching for the optimal solution. And so uh, there's a couple of uh, points here. Um, first of all, uh, we are optimizing traffic flow velocity and, uh, and also vehicle um a parameter uh using taboo search to do so and we're also uh, looking at the ga statistics statistics of the overall network in order to know how well our network um will uh score in general um and so we're basically running uh taboo to taboo to uh fine tune our x and uh finding um uh, having our stopping criterion be the GEH statistic. Okay, so uh, I think uh, this is actually as much time as I have for now. Um, this is a little bit, uh, this is contact information if anyone has uh, further discussions. 